Hello, 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 everybody. I believe we are live. I believe we are live. I'm here. <laughs> I think we're live. Okay, I'm going to pretend we're live because I have no idea because I'm 45. No, I'm just kidding. I'm pretty good with technology. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We're starting 731. Um, all right, thank you. Ashley says, yes, we are live. So this is part two. For those of you who don't know, this series is a three-part series. Um, it is called Let Me Talk Now because we want it to be a, very, a conversation for uh, the Caribbean people, okay? Because I think we um, experience and live through a very different uh, lens. We view the world through a very different lens. Obviously, every nationality and every culture in the world does. And I wanted to speak to our people, our culture, our parents, and our not so much generation, because we're talking about different generations here. Um, but for those of you who don't know me, I'm Natasha Ram. So hi, I'm a meteorologist um, on 680 News, City News, sometimes breakfast television out of Toronto. Uh, and I had seen a tweet from Brown Girl Diary on Instagram, and it was Indo-Caribbeans for Black Lives Matter. And as I swiped, I kept swiping, they were kind of uh, going deep into... Uh, the racial tensions that still exist to this day in the Caribbean and also outside of the Caribbean, but still within our culture. We are coming to you live here from Toronto, Canada, but some of our panelists here uh, are also from the States, uh, one couple from North Carolina who you're going to be meeting. So this is part two where we're really talking about relationships, how to talk to our partners when one partner um, is, and again, we're talking Indo-Afro-Caribbean here, but a lot of this is going to bleed over into other interracial couples. So we're hoping we have a whole wide range of people joining us today uh, that you're going to get something to take home from this a little bit. In part one, which if you missed it, it was two Thursdays ago. You can find it on YouTube if you uh, go to uh, the BG Diaries, plural, on Instagram. You can find a link there. Or you can simply Google Lewi Tokna, uh, part one and YouTube and you'll be able to uh, find that, okay? And because on that one, we really dove deep historically into the history of the Caribbean and colonialism and the political parties and what has really kind of led up to this and why there is uh, some of this tension that still exists. So uh, before we get to our panelists, uh, we do feel that it is necess necessary to provide a land acknowledgement uh, at the beginning of our event, because of course it demonstrates a recognition of the indigenous lands that we are all sitting and standing on right now. Um, it involves thinking about what has happened in the past what changes can be made going forward to further the reconciliation process. And by making this land acknowledgement, we are saying that we honor this land, we honor the indigenous presence, uh, the dates back over 10,000 years, of course, and recognizing the enduring presence and resilience of indigenous peoples in this area uh, for time immemorial. And it's also a, a reminder that, of course, we are all accountable to these relationships. Uh, so because I am based in Toronto, uh, for part one, we had Amala Bach, who you're going to be meeting shortly. She was in Hamilton. She did the land acknowledgement for Hamilton. I will be doing it right now for Toronto. We acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and we are grateful to have this opportunity to work on this land. So thank you for that. Uh, Amala, in the chat, everyone, in case you missed part one, has just sent a link to part one on YouTube, so you can bookmark that for later. Um, so let's talk more about this series. We're going to be addressing four main topics here. We're going to be topic talking about uh, relationship journeys and the challenges that our couples have faced along the way, family approval or disapproval, uh, the media trauma based on what we are seeing now on the television, everything every uh, year, every month seems to just be getting more and more raw, what we are seeing on television, and how to provide allyship as a non-black person of color in an interracial relationship. So we're going to get right uh, into the panel. Uh, first, let's talk to Amala. Okay, so Amala ba uh, Batch. Amala is a child protection worker, a clinical social worker for children and adolescents, and a cultural diversity advisor at the university level. So Amala, if you can just give us a little bit more about your background uh, so that people can, uh, can get to know you a little bit better. Sure, sure. Um, so I don't 
do all of those things anymore. That sounds like a lot when you rattle it off. So the first <laughs> thing I have done, uh, currently I teach in the Faculty of Social Work at Laurier University here in uh, Ontario. Um, and I've been a social worker for a little over a decade now, which is a lot when I think about it. Um, my partner of eight years is African American. Um, and, you know, as we're talking, we, we talk through kind of some of these nuances of Afro-Caribbean versus African American, um, the different kind of layers of the Black experience and uh, definitely a very different story in the States, but you know, we're not exempt from that um, experience up here as well. So I'm of Indo-Caribbean descent. Both of my parents are from Guyana. Last time I made the joke, you can see the little, uh, the Kytra Falls right there. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I'm very uh, personally and professionally invested in this conversation. We also have um, a young child as well who is biracial. Um, and so personally for me, when, when I was invited to uh, participate in this, um, it's as a kind of facilitator role in providing some mental health um, sort of support and guidance along the way as we have these conversations. And uh, that will be my role here today as well. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, now, I'm a meteorologist. I'm not an expert. So that's why we bring on the experts like Amala and, of course, uh, Dr. Vidal Regisford. So Dr. Vidal, Dr. Regisford is a licensed psychotherapist. He holds postgraduate degrees in social service work, a master's in education, along with a doctor, doctorate degree in counseling and a postdoctorate degree in counseling and psychology. So welcome, Dr. Regisford. We invited you on today to help us with our couples and kind of uh, go that route because I know that you deal with a whole wide range of people, but also tell me about some of the cultural and equity work that, that you've done as well. Over the past 10 years, I've worked in, uh, in a number of places, um, specifically in the corporate sector around diversity and inclusion. My um, last major role was with Pure Later, the Curry company, um, leading their um, diversity and inclusion efforts across the country. And uh, prior to that, I was at George Brown College and worked in a variety of other settings, specifically around diversity and, diversity and inclusion. Um, one organization that I work for is probably the only mental health organization that is um, ethnocentric in its design, and that is across boundaries. So I was a clinical director there, and that's situated right in the city. It's a little unknown agency, but does tremendous work in that they focus on individuals who, um, who are biracial or um, from the diverse communities and they basically provide services for them that where if they went anywhere else, they wouldn't get those services. So mm -hmm. um, a unique organization and did some tremendous work there. And I should say it's really racialized people is whom they serve. Um, so non-whites are not served by that organization. And it's the only one within the lens, it's the only one within Ontario, only one in Canada. So that, that's a little bit of what I've done and uh, mm -hmm. in the corporate world and I have my own private practice that I operate meeting with individuals probably from the ages of 10 to 60. So and everything in between. Okay, good. So when we're talking intergenerational here, you're our guy. <laughs> you're absolutely our guy. Um, we also have uh, two couple, well, three, two and a half couples with us here today. So uh, briefly, we have, let's see here, we've got uh, Samantha and Frederick Raven. Um, so they're a couple from Durham, North Carolina. That is where they currently reside. Samantha is Guyanese. Her mother is uh, Indo-Caribbean. Her father is Amerindian and Black. And she's the operations manager at a meeting and event company for pharmaceuticals. And Frederick is an African-American. He's got two military parents, so he says he moved, he's moved around a lot and is an IT professional. I feel like I'm rattling off the dating game here. Me, Samantha, <laughs> and Frederick. That's exactly how I feel. <laughs> but uh, we're going to hear from them. And just, I'm going to get to you guys to tell us about your relationship journey literally in 30 seconds. Um, I also want to mention uh, that we have Candice with us. Her husband is not able to be with us, but Candace is uh, going to give us that uh, side of, of this relationship. She started an event management business in 2010. Right? Yes. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Oh, he Candace is, is gesturing. Her partner came through. <laughs> Okay, well then, you know what, I'm going to, because I actually didn't print that page off, because I'm a professional, look at me, yes. Usually I, I kind of ad-lib stuff on television when I do weather. So I will, okay, I'm going to throw it to Candace in a moment, and she's going to give us uh, that introduction. And then, you know what, why don't I just leave it to the couples to introduce themselves. So let's go back to Samantha and Fred. Okay, Samantha and Fred, um, first thing we're going to go to is we want to hear about your, tell us about your relationship 
uh, journey. How did you guys meet and what were some of the challenges that you faced uh, being of, of mixed, uh, mixed uh, Caribbean identity? Um, so we actually met um, on Facebook um, like about 10 years ago. Um, he sent me a message and I was like, I have no idea who you are. And then it kind of went from there. But um, I guess, do you want to put any insight on that? Yeah, so, <laughs> so what happened was I invited her out to a party and it took me about three or four times before her to before she actually accepted. Uh, she came to the, well, we actually met in a mutual city. So right in between us, when we met for dinner, um, it was a nice restaurant um, and I took the leftovers home because I didn't want her to just use me for me taking her out from the wheels. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I, I think that we had a chemistry because we were both okay with being able to pick on each other and being able to laugh about it afterwards. Um, I'm sure everybody has their own perspective on how things went with the families. I guess me coming from a military family, I wasn't necessarily the oldest amongst our, our cousins, and it was kind of already accepted that some of our relatives were already interracial dating, so that wasn't as big. Um, it probably became, um, but from your perspective, how was it? Well, you? for me, um, uh, my parents are both Guyanese and um, came over to the States in the, about the 80s, early 80s. Um, and in North Carolina, there were they were probably the only Guyanese people there at that time. Um, so growing up, you know, I think their preference was for me to marry another Guyanese person, um, where you will not find that in North Carolina in the 80s or 90s. And even now, it's really kind of rare. Um, but I think they were still open um, and welcoming to anyone. I have um, three other siblings, um, and I think they've they've really been open compared to a lot of people in our family. I think I, we're the only one um, siblings on my mother's side that we are all um, in inter interracial relationships. Um, you know, my husband's black, and then my sister and um, my brother, their um, significant other is Pakistani. So we kind of, I guess, broke the barrier for our family. But, um, but it is, we do, I've heard comments, you know, the colorism is kind of a thing, you know. I've had um, some talks with my grandmother, like when I told her I was marrying a black guy, she kind of was like, is that what you want to do? And I'm like, yeah. So um, just, you know, kind of talks about that and like what our children would look like and stuff like that, so. Those are the kind of areas, but my mother and my father, my family were pretty accepting. So. Okay, that's good. I'm gonna go over to Candace and Jules and um, ask you guys the same uh, question. Sort of, how did you, how did you guys meet? How did you come together? Give us a little bit of your background relationship. And um, again, some of the, the, the challenges that you had met when you met each other's family. Well, we both, um, we both are Trinidadian. So we live in Trinidad. And um, I think it was maybe around 2007 or so. Are you hearing me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was around 2007 or so. Um, we, we met at a, at a party, um, at a nightclub. <laughs> and, um, you know, we, we became friends, um, but not, 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 not like anything, you know, strong friendship or anything like that. Um, and I, I was studying in Jamaica at the time. And um, Jules was living in Trinidad. So I was back and forth from Trinidad to Jamaica. And um, I invited him over to Jamaica to, you know, come and check out the scene over there. And he came and um, somehow, you know, we just fit like a glove, you know, and that was pretty much it. Uh, we dated for about eight years or so, maybe seven or eight years. Um, I remember, like, for example, my, my family, I think, is already um, mixed interracial. My, my father's side of the family, they are, most of them, some of them are African, of African descent. And my mother's side of the family, um, they were of Indian descent because they were, they were also Muslims, right? So my father's side of the family was, was Christian. Um, however, that, did, that didn't stop. Um, I think the first time I introduced him as my boyfriend to my grandmother on my mother's side, um, 
I could see that, you know, she wasn't, <laughs> she wasn't, she wasn't happy, you know, she wasn't, she was okay because I, I think at that age that I introduced them to her, um, she couldn't, she didn't really have a, have a, a say in it. You know, she wasn't as young as, and as sprightly as she was before. But I know, be, you know, in maybe 10 years before that, she would have been vociferous about, you know, why, why this guy, you know, <laughs> just why this guy. Um, so I can see it on her face. I can see it on her face. But, you know, she, she passed away, sadly, before we got married. Um, but I don't think she would have, you know, done much to object to say. But that was really the only kind of um, friction. friction, I would say, um, on, a, in a pri- on a primary ro- level. On my end, um, I didn't really have much friction. I think I have the same as Candice, where um, my mother's father was Indian, and my her, her mother was Negro. Um, so there, there was already the mix already in the family, and my father was very easygoing. So there weren't really um, any hindrances when it came to my family. So I think that we are blessed, maybe, that we had, uh, we are fortunate that our parents were very open. Um, but yeah, that's how it went. We, I mean, there, there is friction in terms of uh, when we were dating. And, you know, some of my friends would be like, oh, you like Indian girls, huh? Um, <laughs> That kind of thing, but I mean, I think ever ever since young, I mean, I got the uh, nickname uh, Kisun um, <laughs> just because I had an eye for Indian women, and you know, uh, I kissed too soon. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. You know, so I'm hearing a, a similar thread here. So far, we're going back to the older generations. I as well, um, I was married for well, we were together 19 years. Uh, my husband was black from Jamaica. He's actually got a little bit of uh, Asian in him as well. But, you know, when you're black in something, you're, you're black, right? That's the, that's the way that the world perceives you. And for seven years of us dating, she did not talk to him at all. She started having a conversation with him when we got married after seven years of dating. Little bit, little bit. But really, it wasn't until I had kids. So we're talking, you know... Uh, seven, eight, nine, ten, almost ten years after knowing um, this man that she finally started to have uh, any kind of any sort of conversation with him. And I think the the thing there is what I didn't do right, and I'll say I'll say it now is speak up about it. So you know, because this man was feeling a little bit uncomfortable, I didn't recognize it, and I didn't make him feel comfortable in my home when she was around. You know what I mean? And so that's what we're trying to do here today is hopefully try to break that because you you have to speak up. This is the time. This is um, where things need to change. So I'm going to go over to uh, or do we have Andrea and Ricardo? Are they here? I don't know if they yes. they logged on yet. Yes, Andrea and Ricardo, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Okay. Oh, nice to meet you guys. Okay. Andrea Abraham, Ricardo Abraham, tell us uh, about your background, your, your heritage, as well as uh, how you guys met your relationship journey. Okay. I'll start. I'm Andrea Abraham. I am a Guyanese and Trinidadian descent. My parents are Indo-Caribbean and I grew up actually in Miami. Uh, we live now in New York City with my husband, Ricardo. Um, we have two young girls, a three, 19 month old. Uh, I work as uh, Vice President for the Accounting Department in an asset management company. Can you give a little background? And I'm, again, my name is Ricardo. Um, I'm an attorney in New York City. I uh, did primarily litigation. Uh, <laughs> I, was also, I was born in Montreal, Canada. Um, so I grew up in Montreal for most of my life until I was 18. Came to New York. I'm of Haitian descent. My parents are Haitian. Um, my, two of my brothers were born in Haiti. I'm, I'm part of four. So my little brother and, and I just grew up in the cold. They grew up in the sun. Uh, so um, we met um, in 2010. Yeah, in Vegas. So, um, <laughs> so what happened? Every, everybody meeting at the fest, eh? Everybody <laughs> meeting at the fest. Or Facebook. Was, yeah, I was in LA at the time, and he is here in New York. And through a mutual friend, like I went to Vegas to spend, hang out for the weekend, and he was there. and. He was my friend's cousin. And then a year later, I ended up moving to New York. And a year after that, got engaged. And then a year after that, and so forth. Um, so 
so the beginning of our relationship was really the first year was long distance. And after we met, pretty much it was basically the phone for three months. And FaceTime had just came out, I think. Yeah. FaceTime was still new. So we were mostly on the phone, like old school. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that was our getting since my family was still in Miami and he was, his were in Canada and New York. So it was pretty much just us in our dating relationship. You know, it was, it was so important to me. I didn't really involve a lot of people right away because I dated <laughs> others before and I didn't feel the same connection. So it kind of was, you know, just us getting to know each other. Um, and I think the main thing for us, even though like I'm Indo-Caribbean descent and he's a Caribbean, Caribbean descent, like I think what connected us was, our shared values, being still from the same Caribbean background. I remember like at that point in that time in my life, it wasn't, you know, what was important to me now when I met somebody was these shared values and that's what really brought us together. And um, I took my time waiting to take him home because I knew this was going to lead to something further um, as maybe I did too soon in previous relationships. So I had to wait this time. Um, and I'm fortunate also that I grew up in Miami and my family, like our parents' families weren't in Miami with us. Like my mom's family was in New York and my dad's family was probably still in Trinidad. So our community became our family. So I grew up around very mixed couple families. Um, my best friend since I was two is half Indian, half black. Her mom is my mom's best friend. So that was never discussed like as a negative in my household. So. I remember the time when it came to take him home, I realized at an older age that I thought I was concerned for a moment. And now that we've been talking about it more and more, I wasn't concerned because of my parents. I believe that like, as I got older and I met other, my friends and the community around me and what they would say started getting into my head. And so I was kind of concerned because they had these issues in their home and their parents wouldn't be okay with this or or this matter or whatnot. So when I took him home, there was nothing. There was like no concern, nothing. He was welcomed from the moment he walked in the door. And for me, it was I didn't, I didn't realize the like the importance of the moment. You know, as I, I was going, oh, I'm with your parents. All right, it's getting serious now. That's it. There was no well, you know, I'm black, um, you know, and you know that aspect of it didn't really playing a big role until I was more immersed within her culture as far as how she grew up. Grew up in Montreal, being 90% of my friends were Haitian. That's what we rolled with and that's what it was, you know? We were very much a tight community in Montreal. Not that we minorities, we have some Trinidadians in Montreal that have as friends. We had um, Jamaicans as well, um, but nothing like when I went to Miami and started seeing the melting pot that is our, our friends. And me being in New York when I first moved there for college, I saw different, you know, skin colors, ethnicities, backgrounds. So I was behind, you know, as far as understanding the whole plight of, you know, um, Indo-Caribbeans coming from the same type of system that brought us to, you know, the Caribbeans in America. Like I didn't realize that until, you know, she told me about it because in Montreal, it's, we didn't, barely knew about anything other than hockey, hockey, hockey. That was basically it. So it was until later that I appreciated or, you know, look back on when I first met her parents, what kind of you know, big deal that was. Right, right, absolutely. Now, um, Andrea, you did say that some of your extended family or other friends and family had told you some things. What were some of the things that you had heard? Well, it wasn't, not my extended family. I've been fortunate to say that I have connected views come into me from my own family. And I know I'm hypersensitive to like, make sure something pops up, I'll be quick to say something. But in my community, it's really my community that I grew up in in my um, majority of my friends were Guyanese and my girlfriends, their parents were more strict, even so to the fact that like, you know, they didn't go away to college where my dad was like, go away to college, then you could do whatever you want. And so it was very old, like old school traditions. And like my girlfriends were kind of like, oh, are you sure that's what you want to do? Like to that extent. So like, I think, I think other people's fears started creeping into my own head 
and I started getting concerned, like, is this an issue? Would this be an issue? Like, is this going to be a problem? And I brought it to his attention. I'm like, I don't, I don't really know if this is going to be a problem, but I just want to put it out there just in case. And then when we've right. been thinking, talking about this more and more now, recently, and I'm like, did you feel any way in my house ever? And he's like, no. And I realized none of that fear ever stemmed from my own individual family, my parents and my upbringing at all. It was kind of the community sense of, you know, you have friends, but you don't marry outside of, at that time, what I heard from every little three-year-old wants to, wants to play. Um, so, so that was, um, which we've been talking about a lot more recently, and I realized, and I even talked to some of my, my close girlfriends I grew up with, and, and she even mentioned, I spoke to her last week before this, and she's like, you know, being in your house, your parents never said anything to the extent that, like, I would hear, and I was like, I didn't even realize it, because I wasn't hearing it in my home, and not hearing what their parents were hearing, but, like, just hearing it secondhand from them, my friends. Yeah. That's why I think it's important to note that, you know, we're here to hear your journeys and your experiences. And by in no way, shape or form are we trying to uh, put everyone into one box because all the experiences right. are so different. And um, we're not trying to speak for a whole race or two races, right? right? All Indo-Caribbeans and all Afro-Caribbeans. But Dr. Right. Regisford, I want to go to you for a second because what are some of, some of the, um, I guess, I don't want to use the word issues because it, it can maybe challenges that interracial um, relationships, specifically Indo-Afro-Caribbean partners may face. I mean, we have the same culture, but different um, sort of upbringings at times, right? Depending on, on what their, their life was. So are there any challenges based on that? Well, I, I, the so I, think, I think what's important is to note the similarities amongst all of the stories, pretty much all the stories that we've heard here. Um, for the most part, it's the parents or grandparents in these instances who have these held values or these beliefs about not coming together and not having these kinds of relationships. To a lesser extent, friends, but for the most part, a generation or two away from where these couples are. And I think that's important to note because this whole issue can best be described as what we would call um, intercultural racism. That's where it really comes from. It comes from the days of colonization and how the slave masters essentially separated the races based on skin color, tone, texture of hair, phenotype. And so based on that, um, you have this notion of proximity, proximity to whiteness. So the closer you are to whiteness and the further away you are, um, you're subjected to a level of treatment. And so that and the vestiges of that have been passed down and no surprise to me that it's the grandparents and great grandparents who really might not have been schooled in, in, in some of their modern thoughts around how people get along and how people, how people build relationships. So I think I want, I want to situate my thoughts in, in that respect. Some of the obvious challenges are of course, from generation to generation, um, class of course comes into play as well, money, wealth and in the Caribbean, you see the stratification of those um, and perhaps even along color lines where the perception is the lighter you are, the better jobs you get, the darker you are, the more challenge you have in terms of poverty. And then how that plays out in communities, how that plays out in relationships. So part of the challenges that naturally would occur is dealing with family. And most yeah, of the people here are fine, met, fell in love, Facebook, you know, whatever it is. But the difficulty is now you go beyond that circle. So your first circle is you and your, your, your companion. The next circle is that of family and friends and what will they perceive and how will they behave? And then from then, thereafter, the third circle is probably coworkers and colleagues and those who you meet in the public, right? So you have these levels of intervention in a romantic relationship that ought not to be. And so navigating that becomes really difficult because at all times you are deeply conscious, deeply conscious of the tensions that are going to be raised, whether it be within your immediate family or whether it be by coworkers who might be surprised and make comments like someone made a comment. Um, uh, I think it was Samantha who said, her grandmother said, you know, is that what you want to do? You know, you know, mm -hmm. without coming out and saying, are you sure you want to marry a black man, the microaggression is, are you sure that's what you really want to do? 
And so these subtleties come into play that you've got to grasp with. They're not necessarily as overt and um, as direct, but they're very subtle. And yet you know something's gone wrong with what was stated and you've got to figure out, well, how do you respond? So those are some of the natural challenges. And then of course, lastly, your children and, and coaching your children, training your children, because now you've got grandparents on both sides, right? And depending on how grandparents respond and treat the child, um, you might find one set of grandparents um, a distant, another set of grandparents a more engaged. Again, all stemming from this notion of intercultural racism, which we need to name. That's what it comes down to. We need to name it and say that it exists and say that the only way that we eradicate that is by having these courageous conversations amongst ourselves. And really, as some of you said, you know, putting a stop to it, which comes with a price. There's a price to putting a stop mm -hmm. to it because then your family theoretically are in a position where they can say, well, we don't want anything to do with you. We disown you. Yeah, it can, it can be that extreme. And so there's this notion of acceptance. This is what we all want, right? Yes, we're in love with somebody, but if mom or uncle or auntie or your cousin has something to say about it, then you don't want to feel diminished. So I'm going to go to Amala. What, talk to me about the importance and value of feeling accepted by your family and your friends. Well, I, some people will say like, I don't care, right? Like, I don't care. I'm going to do what I want, but deep down. Yeah. And okay, I think really. Dr. Regisford kind of uh, began to touch on this, the, the Caribbean culture, right? Community is so, so important to us. It's, it's like a, um, it's a fundamental thing when we think about building our own families. Um, and we see our, our little friends in the corner in Andrea and Ricardo's uh, Zoom, you know, like it, we have that saying, well, a lot of communities do, it takes a village. So when we're talking about building a family or, or you um, kind of like uh, Andrea pointed out, like you make that decision, like, okay, this is serious, this is moving forward. It's not just me and this person, it's how does this person fit with my family? Um, and I think Dr. Regisford also made a very important point um, that kind of relates to what you said, Natasha, about how do we respond or not respond? Because you mentioned kind of, you know, for, for almost seven or eight years that you didn't, you weren't able to respond or you, or you felt that you couldn't. Um, and sometimes as it is pointed out, it's that kind of microaggression, like, is that what I think it was? Am I overreacting? Am I being hypersensitive? Um, and especially with the respect that we talked about last time in our, um, in our first thing of uh, our first panel round, talking to our parents or to talking to the elders in our community, that's another kind of very Caribbean value too, right? Is uh, like, who are you to talk to me about this, right? You, you haven't been through what I've been through or you don't, you don't know these people like I do, right? And so um, I actually wanted to go to our, we have a, a live Q and A. Um, so we have an anonymous question from one of our attendees and I'm going to read it through and perhaps I'll toss it to Dr. Regis for to maybe offer some insight. Um, because it really relates to this conversation. I think we have in our panelists a lot, a lot of positive experiences, which is really nice to hear too, and it offers a lot of hope as well. Um, but I think that's not the key for, for this um, question. So uh, the questioner writes, in my 20s, I fell in love with someone who was black and my family hated it. And I was living with my parents at the time and I got to a tipping point where I broke it off because I felt that I was never going to get the family acceptance. I'm now in my 30s and this experience has scarred me and I find myself not being open emotionally when I'm dating ever since. How did you combat the hate within your own families about being in an interracial Caribbean relationship? How did you not let the fear of familial rejection get to you? Um, and this, this attendee then adds that their, their grandma was very vocal about it. Thank you. Uh, before I respond, I think everyone's heard the question, especially the couples who have lived it it might be useful to get some feedback from them, Natasha, around how they've coped and how they've managed. And certainly I'll add in, but I think it's really important for those who are chiming in to also hear from those who have gone through it and how they've overcome. Absolutely. Well, but the couples, the couples that we have, as Amelis said, we've had some pretty positive experiences. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I'll tell you one that just happened to me in January. So I said I was with uh, my ex for 19 years, so I uh, dating again, and um, North Carolina. 
So we'll send it to maybe, is it the Abrahams that are in North Carolina? No, the Ravens. The Ravens are in in, uh, in Raleigh, right? So Charlotte, North Carolina. And I, um, we, we've been dating for about a year and a half and uh, said to my mom, I would like you to meet him. Um, and I felt, you know, I'm 45 years old. I felt like I was 16 again and nervous to, to uh, bring him home to meet my mom. But I thought, well, you know what? I mean, my ex, my ex was black and she has two beautiful grandchildren. She's gotten over all of that. But the comment that came out of my mom's mouth was, you just can't stay away from them, can you? Mm -hmm. I said, what did you just say? And now I'm at the point that I am starting to speak up now. I didn't speak up 19 years ago or 15 years ago or 10 years ago, but I said, what did you say? And um, she, she kind of pulled back a little bit and I, I talked to her about it, but months later. So I didn't actually say anything. I just said, what did you say? But it wasn't until about a month ago when uh, this panel actually came up and I started talking to her about it and she was very open about it. And I think, you know, um, we talk more about how to talk to our parents and grandparents in part one, but it, I approached it more like, you know, what, as Amala, I learned this from Amala in part one, approaching it with what were things like for you back home? What did you experience back home? How, you know, why do you have this belief? Where does this stem from? So kind of approaching it from an empathetic uh, place as opposed to attacking. And I think before I used, I, I, if I did say anything, it was kind of attacking, like, you can't say that. Why are you saying that? You know, and, and that's just absolutely not the right way to do it. So I, I think I had a pretty good conversation um, with, with my, with my mom uh, about it. And, and then she, you know, she's quite, quite open uh, to him and, and other things now because we have had that conversation. And again, this was just about a month ago. So it's, it's in the, the way you approach it, but you do, you get scared, you get, um, you feel angry, you feel, um, I, fe I felt kind of like, gee, I feel like one of your patients all of a sudden, I'm supposed to be hosting this thing, what just happened? <laughs> So, so I'm, right, I'm listening. But, I'm listening. I like to say something because I like to ask a yeah. question, and it seems like the common thread between all the guys is, for the most part, we didn't necessarily think about it. We didn't quite internalize the idea of dating outside our race. So this is almost a two-part question. The first question is, how would our responses be if the if the sexes were mixed? You know, same race but a different sex. Would, would we then have that same, um, I guess, hesitancy of the ex expectations of our family? And then I guess the second part to that would be the question, not so much race, but is there a sense of the, having a male patriarchy system in place to where men aren't necessarily questioned on their actions as much as sometimes women are? That's a good question. And maybe I don't know, Amala might be able to answer a little bit of that one. I th yeah, those are those are great questions. Um, I I wish my partner was here because I think I'd love to hear from them. And um, when we when we talk about our interracial relationships, it's first of all, Natasha, I just want to say thank you for being so open. Um, with I'm going to get licks just now. Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Shut down. Licks is going to share. Um, no, but I think it's really important yeah. to be able to have these conversations. And, you know, it, sometimes it is, you know, what happens at home stays at home. Don't tell nobody what happened here. Um, all of that kind of stuff. But it is really important to interrogate that. And um, last week, Frederick, to your question, we, uh, or last panel, sorry, we did start to talk about a little bit of the patriarchy and how that kind of shows up in Caribbean families of, um, you know, I might be able to say something to an aunt or a grandmother, but not have the same kind of weight uh, with, with uh, males in my family. Um, and so males not having to answer for their behavior in the same kind of way. Um, but one thing that I know uh, in my own personal experience is, is the idea of white black um, when it comes to race, that it, it's either this or that when it comes to interracial relationships. Anytime you kind of hear about uh, stories of interracial relationships, it is it is that black and white, right? And um, so one thing that <laughs> my uh, mother-in-law told my partner was, as long as they're not white, bring home whoever, right? So it's, it's kind of that, um, that shared experience of racism. Um, it's unfortunate to bond over oppression. Um, but it's really, you know, there's a depth of understanding where uh, 
I don't, I don't know. I don't know that a white person would have that depth of experiential understanding. So from my own personal perspective, I feel like, um, uh, I mean, obviously, again, this is, you know, a female perspective. So maybe I'll ask Jules or, Ricor or, or Ricardo to, to speak to that. And, and, Nat and Natasha, if I can, I, I do want to get back before we lose the question that was raised. Um, in response to that question, I think like what you have done, what you had done, and that is you engage in the conversation. I think that's important for you to exhaust that. So you live with no regret of not being impetuous or impatient. And then you have another label on you. Oh, well, there she's gone. She's gone to marry somebody else. And now she's, not, now she's turned to be rude. You don't want yeah. that. So you have to do your best to have the conversation. But I do think at some point or another, as mature adults, we make a choice for love and we make a choice for whom we want to love. I think at the end of the day, we do that. This is one of those corridors in life that we go through. And ultimately, we mm -hmm. get responsibility of it. We will be in the same home with someone, sleep in the same bed, do everything with that person that we've chosen to for the rest of our lives. So why will you let or give up your power to someone who's not in that relationship? I think, I think it's so important for you to maintain your own sense of power, personal power, identity, and your desire for love and to be loved by whom you choose. Once you've gone through that exhaustive process of actually trying to bring people around, because, and understand also you're not, you're not going to win everyone over and that's okay. And it might be that you're not winning mom and dad over. I think ten, things tend to change. Um, as I've seen in my family, things tend to change when there are grandchildren in place. Everyone seems to warm up a little bit more. They tend to hide behind the grandchildren as a way of masking their racism and their bigotry. And I think we have to give people room to save face, unfortunately, in those, in those instances, especially when we know they're older and probably won't get through to them. Um, regarding Samantha and Frederick's question, the first part of Frederick's question, I think if I heard it correctly, I think you'll find that even in a situation where you have two people from the same, um, who say, let me just say, for example, who are African, in, African by way of ancestry. So let me just say Africa from the continent, African from North America. I think you'll still find them getting together will be challenging because now you have the cultural lens that is placed on the, that couple and the customs and the values, which are going to be different and still having to work through. So because you're, because you're, you're black or because you're in the Caribbean and two of you are getting together, it doesn't mean that you're not gonna have challenges. Probably a little bit more distinct than what other couples will face, but you're still gonna be challenged in, to some degree by those cultural differences and the nuances that others begin to impose. And class will be one of them. So, you know, parents, what did, what did the parents do? What occupations did they have? Um, shade, you know, are they lighter, are they phenotype, you know, straight nose, broad nose, big lips, thin lips, all of those things come into play in, and they come through in people's subconscious, they're in people's subconscious that at some point or another are elevated into the narrative of why they don't like someone, even though they're within the same um, ethnicity. Right. Um, Andrea uh, and Ricardo, you wanted to say something? I Yeah, I wanted to mention too, um, Amala, the question that you said somebody's mentioned about, you know, in their 20s. So something happened to me in my 20s where I dated somebody of a, they were from a different ethnicity. Um, and in the end of dating me after a certain period of time, told me I couldn't, they couldn't be with me because we weren't from the same country. And that feeling was just one of the worst feelings ever that I have ever felt that I knew at that moment in time I could never, and I made that choice, like even though it wasn't an issue in my house, but I still made that choice that I would never put somebody through that. So like, as the doctor said, like, it's up to you as a person to know, like, what is your strength? What are you going to, what is most important to you in your life and like who you're going to be with in the end? Because I mean, family is very important, but at the same time, it's, it's you and that, that partner because, and I, I consciously made that decision. I was like, after that feeling, like it is, it's crushing. It's definitely crushing. Um, and I couldn't imagine putting someone else through that, telling somebody because of where your parents are from or where you're from or the color of your skin. Like I couldn't imagine 
me being that person to tell someone else that. And so that was like a big conviction of mine. Um, and that kind of like always, you know, press on to people that I know and friends of mine. I'm like, you know, you have to take care of yourself and you have to, you know, push for what you believe in. And if you feel a certain way, you need to like, be, it's, it's hard. It's definitely hard. I think, you know, Caribbean culture and families are very, can be overpowering, but um, you have to have that conviction. Right. Can, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just <laughs> affirming, affirming what you said and what Dr. Regisford had mentioned about making that conscious choice, right? What, what am I willing to lose for this relationship? Because sometimes it really does come down to that. Um, and we have, uh, we have some other questions rolling in that kind of speak to the same situation. Um, and actually one, uh, one attendee speaks to what Frederick was asking um, and says, uh, I'm an Indo-Caribbean male and my ex was a black female and he was ridiculed for it, right? So I think there is, there is, definitely, um, there is definitely race and gender at play here, right? Um, and uh, another, another um, attendee writes that um, the same kind of story of experience with um, being Indo-Caribbean and dating someone who's black um, and that fear of rejection and the possibility of her partner being disrespected is actually stopping her from bringing him home. So right now she is not even, uh, it doesn't say how long they've been together, but she has met his family um, and he uh, has not met her family out of that fear. So, right. what, about, so what about Candace and, and Jules? Do you guys have any, any comments on this? Maybe from past relationships or, or other family uh, that have experienced things like this? And, and how did that make them feel, do you think? What do you say, um, Natasha, as in bringing, bringing a fellow another race home? Um, I think I, I could share one experience, and I think it, it, um, it builds on what uh, the uh, doctor was saying. Is, is it the doll? That's right. Okay, right. So, um, like, one side of my family, they are Indian. And I think for me, they think Jules, he is African, not, not just African, but he is also um, he has dreadlocks, so you know, you'd call him Rastafarian, and so Rasta. So for me, that was another, that, that was another level. <laughs> 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 that was another level that I that added on because of his hair, you know, because hair, hair is a major, a major factor in, in, this, um, in this whole competition. And so for me, I remember, um, there's one particular, I guess, grouping of, of my family that um, they're Hindus and they're, they're, they're all East Indian. Um, and for me, there was a lot of fear in taking him to their, to their home um, because I would have heard comments before, not about him, but, but, you know, but just racist comments about, you know, black people and Africans and this and that and, you know, stereotypes of, of you know, dis discriminating things. So for me, taking him there was, it was, it was, it was fearful. But as um, Dr. Regisford said, um, you know, you just have to remember that this is the person that you love. So for me, I know that this is the person that I love, and he is a lovely person. So for me, it was just about taking him there, and, you know, actions would speak louder than words. So, you know, eventually, they fell in love with him just as much as I, I loved him, you know? I didn't have to say anything. Uh, but, yeah, I did have fear in the beginning of, of like introducing him because you know not only was he Afro but he also was Rasta, Rasta Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, this and these are all important conversations to have, and I do now see the the chats coming in that people experiencing it, so much of the same. And we are going to get yeah. to some of the questions, um, but we I'm going to kind of do a 180 here, and I want to switch over to uh, some of the other questions that we wanted you guys to speak to today or tonight. Um, you know, we want to switch gears and talk about being in an Indo-Afro-Caribbean relationship and seeing all of the trauma that we're seeing on television now, um, literal um, lives being snuffed out on air, on TV, on social media. You know, sometimes we'll run into our partner and say, uh, oh my gosh, did you see the latest? Did you see this video? Did you see this? Not understanding that this is their father, their uncle, their brother, these are the faces that they're seeing, right? We may, we're people of color, but we're not, I'm not seeing 
my uncle so and so but they are so uh, talk to me about um how you guys have been dealing we'll start with you guys with um candace and jules how have you guys been talking to each other and navigating what has been going on uh with what we've been seeing uh, in the media these these past months um for me of course i i am an east indian um so i can't empathize with let me say let me not say i can't empathize i i am not you know in, in the situation of being a, an african um afro caribbean person so for me it's not a, it's not about my my history it's not my history you know um so for me it was just about i know that i have a, an afro caribbean husband and i need i need i need to be sensitive to his feeling of whatever may come up in this particular situation so for me it was it was about going back in history and really educating myself um on why why we are here you know um and of, of recent you know in trinidad we've we've also had a, a, another a, a civil unrest is, is currently on ongoing um which would have come from a similar situation where systemic. yeah it, it's systemic you know like um it was free slaves who settled in a particular area and you know these people now um they they are the privileged they they suppress they oppress and so for me it's about going back and understanding really truly the history about why because you know you see somebody you see a man but you really don't know his history and, and where he's come from you know what he has walked yeah. 500 years ago he we, we, we have to understand these things we can't just assume that it's just now you know it's your life alone that we're going to judge you know we can't just say okay you were born with this you have this you have this opportunity but it is yes it is a mental oppression that these people are dealing with yeah. and you know as somebody on the other side i need to i need, i know that i need it so i i yeah. empathize um and i i feel it in my heart because i believe we are all one so i know that i need to educate myself on why and what why we're here yeah. why we're here so that you know i could also share with others others who might not be impacted um you know on the situation yeah i think it's a lot of knowledge we are in a lot of pursuit of knowledge especially seeing that we come from the caribbean side of it which is i mean we may not have um racism sometimes we experience colorism um on this side of of the caribbean region um but even with what has happened in america i think what has really uh, uh strengthened our relationship is our ability to discuss it and try to pursue the knowledge behind it so even as we back i think candace didn't know much about the 92 riot like i had to show a documentary on netflix for her to understand the riots then in comparison to the rioting now so i think like a lot of the knowledge sharing has become very apparent and i think it's as a as a couple uh, we are, we are in the pursuit of fully understanding what is the systemic yeah injustice and where did it all originate yeah, the roots the roots the roots of everything that has transpired to this day Yeah. Right. So you guys have been communicating really well and it must have how did it feel Jules when 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 um, she said I am going to go and learn. I'm going to go and educate myself. How no, did I you think feel? it's good. I think it's good because I mean we are all in pursuit of knowledge, you know, even for myself because even if it is that you know as you said like we have colorism here and sometimes these things that we are, we say we are so we are so ignorant of certain things and certain facts. So for me the discussion is real when you have I mean your wife and a husband and you all are discussing issues of this nature to me that is real substance because sometimes it's even difficult to have these conversations with your friends. I have some US friends that I'm in a group and it took a lot out of me. I think it it, it took a lot out of me to actually say guys I don't think that slavery is something that should be to joke about and these are long time friends and i think they they just they just uh, they just not understanding i think a lot of the times people are just not understanding of the situation and it's almost like they say things and they do things and they're just not cognizant of what is really going on or what is really the root of the yeah. problem so for me the conversation mm-hmm. here in the home is great 
because it gives me more strength and more, I guess, more ability to have these conversations with other people, whether it be family, whether it be friends, you know, because I'm able to bounce off these ideas and have these sort of conversations with my wife. Right. You mentioned the state. So let's go. Let's go there. Let's go to North Carolina to Samantha and Frederick. And how have you guys been communicating about uh, what is, has been just bombarding us from the news these days? Um, so I know that I have been probably watching the news 24 <clears throat> seven and just having full time commentary, just talking about it um, with family, friends. Um, my husband and even with my children, um, my, my youngest, uh, we have two boys, an eight-year-old and a five-year-old, and my five-year-old came up to me and asked, um, you know, why were the police killing black people on television and asked if we were going to die um, and, and, you know, having those difficult conversations with the five-year-old, um, you know, it's just something that we just had to start doing and, and talking to them about. Um, but for me, you know, growing up in North Carolina, again, there aren't, there were not a lot of people that looked like me. They were not Guyanese, they know, you know, Caribbean people. It was white and black people that we grew up with. So I think growing up in, in the beginning, I think, you know, I learned a lot about kind of what was going on from the beginning, you know, systemic racism. And I've always been really involved in, you know, culture and trying to learn as much as I can. Um, because again, you know, North Carolina, if you're not white, you're black, and that's it. That just was growing up, you know, in the early 90s. So that kind of where, you know, learning about black culture and history, you know, was pretty important and resonated with me. So my perspective, um, being black, growing up um, South Dakota, Virginia, throughout the South, I saw racism extremely early. So my perspective is generally by default, always on the defensive end. Like you just have to, you just have to understand that you have to be prepared for when racism may come at you. It could be something from being five years old and being called a nigger while you're, you know, riding your bicycle around the, um, the neighborhood. Mind you, this is on a military base. So this is, this is one of those things where my dad was high enough ranking in the military at that time, that if you, if I was to actually have said to him what was told to me, it could have um, had other people's families in trouble for doing stuff like that. But, but I, I think at an early age, I realized that there were just certain things that, yes, I could have told him, and yes, he could have acted on it, but there's always, there's always another um, back end in which you end up getting penalized for. And at the end of the day, I, I think my parents never really stopped me from watching anything that was violent or anything else like that, because I think growing up in America, you become so decentralized to violence that it's, it's, it's normal. So sometimes when people see that people are, are killed and, and they have the videos and stuff, it's like in my mind, I know that I'm supposed to be super saddened by it, but I'm like, this happens all the time to me. This is, it just happened to be on video now. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, people, funny thing I'll tell you. So growing up, I'm 14 or 15, and you always hear about people, you know, going to college, but before they go, they're going to go on a cross country drive. And in America, it's like 3,000 miles from end to end. So that's like a three day three-day drive, literally. That never, you never really hear a Black person say that uh, because you still have states and cities that you cannot drive through, you cannot stop to, and they literally had a movie, um, I'm not sure if any of you all have, have ever seen or even heard about it, where it talks about the Green Book. And what the Green Book was, was back in the days um, when Blacks basically had to be inside before nighttime, there was a little Green Book that you would use and it would let you know where you could actually stay at for a hotel room, where you could get gas at. So it wasn't like you could just travel freely across the country. Um, so this is stuff that's still ongoing now. It's just now that we have video cameras and cameras, people hear about it a little, little bit more, but I mean, they would build towns through your neighborhood. Uh, you wouldn't be able to get loans for, for any type of home. Um, when, when we moved to our neighborhood in Durham growing up as a kid, uh, my parents were, they were veterans, so they had a GI Bill, which allowed them to get a different type of mortgage that a lot of other Black people at the time weren't necessarily able to get. So we would have co a cousin that would always walk through our house. And it was probably three to four times that he was picked up by the deputy sheriff because they didn't believe that he was actually walking to our house. So it was just, it was just regular. It was normalized. And that's, 
unfortunate, but that's just what you deal with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Andrea and Ricardo, you know, anti-black racism is global. And so it's so nice to hear the different perspectives, right? We're hearing the American perspective. We're hearing the Trinidadian perspective. Um, but Andrea and Ricardo, can you just talk to me a little bit about what your communication has been like based on uh, what we've been seeing on the media? Yeah, sure. Um, I know, like, definitely living in New York, I feel like we've seen a lot of this for years um, and the news ongoing. And we've always had like really open conversations. I'm always like, I ask a ton of questions and I feel like, cause he's some conversation and I'm always like, I ask a ton of questions. Oh. And, and so I'm always asking and asking him like, you know, help me understand on and, and whatnot. And so we've kind of always had an open conversation and mm -hmm. just my trying to yeah. educate myself as well, but always kind of deferring to Ricardo to be like, what, how do you feel about what's going on? What's, what, how can you explain this better to me? What's going on legally? What do you, what can you, what can be done? How, how can you explain these things to me? Um, that's like for on the way we're communicating it. And like, I guess also when it comes to like systemic racism, like how Samantha mentioned, like being in North Carolina, um, if you're not white, you're black. Like I feel in Miami, it was really diverse, but once I started the workforce, being in finance is per, uh, like, um, I feel that way at work. Like being in a, a white male dominated industry, I feel like I, it's since the day one I started work, I, I felt this pressure also at the same time and felt where I'm being blocked at any given point because not being white. And so like, that's mm -hmm. always been a topic of conversation when I come home from work and he comes home from work. So we have that where we can um, discuss and kind of vent and try to like, he helps me understand he, and I try to help him understand. And that's like a, been a common denominator for, for us um, in our communication. And I, I, I do agree, like, as was mentioned before, you know, I don't wanna age myself, but I remember very well, you know, Rodney King, the Watts riot and everything from OJ on and the riots from that. And, the vitriol in the news regarding, you know, these cases, you know, since the 90s, and I grew up in Montreal, so I was always the only black kid in elementary school, you know, not until I got, I would say, to high school that I started making more friends and more of us, you know, looked like me, so it was something that unfortunately I've not been numb to, but I've been so used to it, but what happened, you know, recently, we said everything because I've never seen anything like this in my life. That was worse than, you know, Rodney King and everything else that I grew up with. And that's something that really hit me very hard. And, you know, that kind of made me, again, relive a lot of the things that I grew up with. Going to school, having a teacher treat me differently, not knowing why as a kid, but later on in life, I'd be oh, wow. She didn't, she, she didn't like me because of the color of my skin. I was always a kid getting these comments. My homework was late. It wasn't good enough or God forbid it wasn't clean enough. Um, I would get signaled down. And as I grew up, these things just kept on building in my brain and over and over and over again, going to a store and not getting the same treatment automatically, you know why. And yeah. it's hard to try to yeah. just like remove yourself from that. But the best way you dealt with it is by always having a diverse set of friends, you know, so you understand each other, you know, you want to make sure whatever your color is, you're welcome to come to whatever events we have. We don't separate our friends based by events because we want to hear different perspectives. So when topics like this come up, you know, we don't want to shy away from it from our friends and from us. So we bring it up and we share how we think about it. And that was, you know, one way that we really deal with that is by just sharing our perspective, you know, growing up diverse. I grew up, you know, not a diverse environment. And as we get older, we share more and more of these, um, of these stories. So just talking about it, basically. Right. Amala, um, we're hearing a lot about, um, you know, daily, weekly, monthly, lifetime trauma based on life experiences based on what we're seeing on TV, based on how, we, you know, how we're treated at work. So Amala, how does this kind of interject itself into the couple relationship? How does it manifest itself? Mm -hmm. Actually, I think for this question, I'll, I'll pass it over to Dr. Regisford because I, 
I thought you had unmuted yourself, and I was hoping that, that you <laughs> speak to the idea of how uh, race-based trauma shows up um, for folks in, in their intimate relationships, in their uh, romantic relationships. Well, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be unusual. And, and I think, you know, Ricardo, thank you for sharing, because one of the questions that I did want to ask is, is for the men to speak about, you know, what their experiences were and what were the conversations within the homes when they saw that video. I think that would be really insightful for the audience to hear between the couples, because that's probably one of the worst events that any one of us can, any of us can ever experience. So what kind of conversations occur within a home from silence to an in-depth conversation and what was it like? Um, but I'll leave that for afterwards. I think my, my approach to this is this. This is racial trauma. This is a racial injury. And so let's just acknowledge it for what it is. And it wouldn't be unusual for having seen and experienced that for the men there as men who are black around the world to internalize and to begin to look at themselves introspectively and think about this that could have been me i could easily at any given time not be going home to my family or my children that in and of itself is traumatic because you're placing yourself in george floyd's position as a man who is like him with all of the issues of life that we all deal with family bills responsibilities work all those things and in a moment your life is snuffed out from under you. And so thinking that through and thinking about the impact on your family, thinking about the impact on your children and what happens to your children when they grow up brings with it a level of stress. So it wouldn't be unusual if one sleepless, irritable, silent, isolating, um, just lacking focus within the relationship. So the relationship seems to be, or he seems to be off, he's not himself. So what's required when that happens? It requires what someone has already spoken about, I think it's Candice, and that is to engage in the conversation. To, to first acknowledge that this has happened. Don't deny it. It has happened. I've seen it, we've seen it. It's there in full view. Let's just acknowledge it and acknowledge it for, for its horror. And then, to talk about, well, I want to listen, I want to learn, I want to understand what it is that you're feeling. And to move far away from the head, because we all tend to, when we are in this freeze mode, because that's what's happening with trauma, we've just frozen. Wow, that could have been me. We can either fight back and get angry and say, well, I want to go out on the streets and protest and do a whole lot more, or I'm going to run from this. I'm going to pretend it didn't happen. But I think if we, if we accept freeze is a, is, is, a, is a reality for all of us because we're not able to um, involve ourselves in that issue at the time, it's beginning to think through, well, what is it that I'm feeling that I can really talk about that's safe? And ensuring that your, your companion is, and your partner is clear about listening so that they can learn and better understand what is going on within you and within your heart, your emotions. What are those feelings? And then as a couple thinking through, well, what can we do? What can we do together? Is it sitting down and talking about, uh, talking about this with our children? Some couples, believe it or not, um, that I've dealt with are saying, well, should we talk to our children? Should we not? I say, why not? They're probably hearing about it anyway. You might as well be the first to deliver what is probably the most accurate information on this and the most valuable perspective on it. But that would be part of it. But focusing on the individual, and the emotions that they're feeling is really critical. And talking, you know, try to filter out the pat answers. Oh, I'm okay, I'm okay, no, I'm fine, I can manage. You know, talk to me, how are you really feeling? What's going on within you? That's essential, because when you do that within 30 days, they say you deal with trauma better. Cortisol levels go down, um, stress levels go down. You're a better able to deal with it immediately rather than delayed. So Candice and Jules, so, I mean, you talked about how um, you educated yourself, but what were the conversations like regarding, especially Jules's feelings, right? Like you talked about what you did and, and how you educated yourself, but did you ask him, um, you know, how, how are you doing? How are you feeling to sort of get his perspective? I, I did. 
um, but I can also tell that he, you know, he he was taking it, you know, he was emotional about it. Um, whereas I would have taken a more objective approach. I knew I knew that it, it was deeper for him. It was it was more deeper rooted. So, like for example, I remember, um, you know, some facts about you know some, some certain facts of in the U.S. situation came up. And I was like, you know, I was approaching it very objectively. I was like, so, you know, what if, what if, you know? Um, but Jews, on the other hand, because he was, he is so connected to, you know, the, the issue of, you know, Black Lives Matter, and he is, he is Afro-Caribbean. Um, he took it a little more personally. He didn't really want to see the facts. He didn't want to see the objective, uh, objectiveness of it, you know? Um, so I kind of re recognized that, and I had to take a little step back, um, and it's apply a little more empathy towards, you know, understanding him in the situation. And Jules, you're able to open up to her. Obviously, she's your partner. And, and how did that make you feel? I felt great because I, I felt that um, it was my job to help educate her. It was my job. So because, let's just say, um, Take, for example, it was not just the George Floyd situation. I wanted her to get an understanding of the past. And I felt that um, a lot of people in general, this is why I said knowledge is key, are not cognizant of the fact of what transpired in the past. So those discussions were actually very uh, exciting because I was able to broaden her mind in terms of slavery, in terms of uh, even from a Caribbean perspective, you know, these slaves were brought over here. You know, it's, it, it was meaningful discussion. So for me, it was, um, it was a very interesting time because we were on lockdown uh, in terms of quarantine. So we spent a lot of time with each other, <laughs> speaking, about, um, speaking about this scenario, speaking about the past, looking at a lot of uh, YouTube and Netflix. And it was just like uh, information, knowledge. Knowledge is power. So for me, it was, uh, it was very beneficial. And I'm, I'm really glad that I, I had the ability to share that with my wife. Right. Samantha and Fred, how did that conversation go in your house about feelings? Um, I probably did not ask him how he felt but he knew how i felt about the situation um i went and protested uh, really vocal i've been vocal on social media um at my job um i work in in probably an inclusive all white um capacity so speaking to them on that and trying to develop a diversity and inclusion um, in a company that is a global company um, that doesn't have that. So I didn't have that conversation with him to ask him how he felt, but I know he knew that I was very outspoken about it and, and how I felt on that situation. And I'm a, um, I'm a governmental employee and I'm also the, um, the chair of a foundation for a historic black organization in Durham. So um, at times I'm fairly sparse with my language in, in certain topics because I don't want to I don't want to have it be seen as if I'm speaking on behalf of the organization or that I'm speaking as a government employee. So I'm, I'm always cognizant of that. So I definitely always support everything that she does uh, because in my absence she's able to advocate on my side. Right. Um, would you like to have that conversation though about how you're feeling if you haven't had it yet with your wife? I think she knows me well enough to know that I'm not really <laughs> a big expressor, uh, expressor of emotions. Uh, she usually has a great vibe for that. Um, but, you know, I, I'm one of those kids that never really even had that conversation about the birds and the bees with their parents, you know? It was kind of like they asked me and I said, well, what do you need to know? You know, so I, she knows me. Well, you could have both <laughs> conversations now. Just <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, Natasha, I feel like you're uh, yeah, like uh, Dr. Regis Ferd and I are indoctrinating you, be, making you a therapist in training. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. 
I feel like I played both roles. I played patient and I played doctor today. So I'll go over to Andrea and Ricardo and ask you the same thing about uh, the feelings conversation. Because I'll tell you with my current partner, a lot went by and we are also in a long distance relationship because he's in Charlotte and I'm in Toronto and we haven't seen each other since March and because of COVID, which really needs to go away now. So everything has been FaceTime or, or, or phone call um, or video chatting. And it's, uh, oh, what's this? Hold on, someone's like, we should get your partner on now. <laughs> but it took me a while to even ask him. I was, and again, it was the same, like, did you see this? Did you see this? I can't, he's like, this is the latest. Like, this is awful. But I never sat and just, quieted the conversation and said, how are you doing? How are you feeling? So did you guys have that convo? I finally did, by the way. So we're still together. But <laughs> yeah. Well, I, <clears throat> out of the two of us, I'm more quick to anger or passionate, as you would say, and he's more level headed. So the way we had the conversation was, I'm like, aren't you angry? <laughs> like, aren't you, aren't you really upset? And he's like, yes. But he does, like, that's just how he processes it. He's not going to jump out and kind of jump, like, go off on the rails at home about this with me. But, like, I know. Um, but I, I'm the type of person, like, I need to see, like, I, are you angry? And he's like, of course I am. And um, so that's how that conversation started. And if you want to take it from there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I mean, unfortunately, sometimes as an attorney, you know, you always want to process everything before you finally come to make a statement or, you know, um, have a reaction to something. But that was clear. I've, you know, and I'm going to say this, that to this day, I can't watch the full video. I can't. I really can't. It really gets to me, gets to me a point of anger. And the reason why I became a lawyer as well, you know, I was pulled over once as well and said to myself, oh, no, next time I'll get pulled over, I'm going to tell something. You know, I'm going to know my rights. You know, I was in Montreal. So the anger that I felt was so passionate that I knew if I let it out, nothing good would come out of it. And that's how usually I am, you know. Call it Haitian blood. Get really hot real quick. <laughs> <laughs> so... So, but to this day, I, you know, and I, I watched something on TV, uh, like a Dev Chappelle skit that was eight minutes and 46. And I realized after watching it, I'm like, wow, that was a long eight minutes and 46. And I could not, and that solidified my position that, like, speaking about trauma, I can't watch it fully. I All have right. to stop. I'll you know say. So, even though she didn't see me get out and then I'm gonna push something. That's how I felt inside. So, but when she did ask me, "Oh, you're angry?" Yes, absolutely. Why would you even? I want to hear yeah. him say it. Like, I want to. I want to see that because <laughs> I'm angry. Like, I, uh, I know I'm, but I will tell you. But yeah. that again, it's it's not because of the way I grew up. It's really because, and again, in my profession, you have to keep, uh, you know, feeling really control and be level-headed. It's something that I think most people need, and to be able to verbalize how you feel versus to react, you know, too much emotionally, basically be able to compose yourself and then react. Whether or not it's emotionally at that point, whether or not it makes you want to cry or yell or scream, at least process it through and understand why you feel that way. And I'm still angry. And again, that's the reason why I can't watch it. It's just, it's too much. Right. A lot of the um, conversations we're talking about, I'm going to go to Amala next, because I want you to speak to the, the difference um, in these interracial relationships, I would say that, and I said it at the beginning, that we're going to cross over to a lot of different types of interrelation, uh, interracial relationships, but being people of color in that relationship with um, uh, someone who is Black is very different than a white-Black relationship. Mm -hmm. So Amala, like, tell me about this difference when we're talking about racial trauma and, and the difference between those two different types of relationships. Yeah, so I think when I was when I was doing some research um, uh, for classes and for for this uh, this conversation, actually, a lot of times when you look up how to support your black partner, it's always written from a white perspective, right? It's written from the perspective of someone who has not themselves experienced racism, right? And I would hazard a guess and say all of the Indo-Caribbean uh, folks on this panel have 
some type of experience with racism, right? So, so we, we know, we understand from an experiential point of view, what it is like to be on the receiving end. But I think the big difference is, and this is kind of what we had talked about uh, in our first panel, what Dr. Regisford mentioned, what Candace and Jules have mentioned who are in Trinidad kind of living this reality, is that there is a difference in anti-Black racism versus racism. And that is a difference that we as non-Black people of color have to realize that there is this very systemic nature to anti-Black racism that shows up globally, right, um, through histories of um, the transatlantic slave trade, um, histories of colonization and all of those things, but it manifests in every facet of life. So now we're having this conversation specifically because of um, increased attention on police brutality and um, the murder of George Floyd, among other people right here in Canada, there was um, the murder of Regis Korczynski Paquet, who was also um, experiencing, a experiencing a mental health crisis at the time of needing police support. And, and there's currently an investigation because it's unclear as to what happened. But um, but it speaks to this idea of kind of um, invincibility, um, that there is this sort of expectation that Black folks be strong, be strong all the time. And especially our, our men, right? I say our because, like I said, my partner is African-American. But the idea that you need to get through this, right? And, and to be fair, Black women have this expectation as well, um, that you have to put on a brave front, right? And so... In my, in my understanding, and I'm so happy to hear um, from our couples that you have that comfort and that safety in your relationship, that you can have these conversations because from what I'm hearing um, and from what I'm seeing with other folks that I work with is there's a lot of racism that happens within the relationship and a lot of invalidating of experience, right? Of, you know, oh, this person called you um, this name. That's kind of obvious, but um, I think it was Ricardo was saying, or, or Andrea was saying, when you're in the workplace and something happens and it's not as explicit, and then your partner questions, well, was that really about race or are you just overreacting, right? And that can be, and, and perhaps Dr. Regisford can talk a little bit more about that, but that can be uh, very, very detrimental to a relationship and just the support that you feel there. Um, so I think there's, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? And, and one of the um, one of our uh, guests commented, um, being controlled so you're not perceived as the angry black person, right? So you're not even entitled to experience your full emotion, lest you fulfill a stereotype, right? Um, a, a lot to unpack there, but Dr. Reed, just for anything to, to add to that? Yeah, I, I just, just want to introduce this, this idea of performance, this notion that as people of color and particularly black people, that you're always in the state of having to perform. It's that old notion, you know, you've got to work 110%. Well, who said that? Why should I have to work 110% and my colleague who's white can get off at 50%? It's because we know if we don't perform, we are the ones that are first going to receive the consequences of that. Why? Because we do not have those prescribed privileges that come with our race. We don't. And so I think it's, we have to understand that black bodies as they operate within the world, black people are constantly under this, this environment of surveillance and having to perform and perform better than those of their white counterparts so that they can equal the playing field. That's their reality. Um, I want to get back to just something that, that I, I just really want to hit home and that is this for the couples you've all done a tremendous job in being supportive to each other and i and i just encourage you to continue to acknowledge anti-black racism for your partner and acknowledge it for what it is as a reality uh, because it's a lived experience it's a lived experience whether it is you know ricardo said you know he has to perform in his job now if he wasn't a lawyer or if he was retired, he could probably relax, but he knows he has to be that way because it's not going to get the best out of him. If it doesn't get the best out of him, his family is affected. His livelihood is affected. Okay. That's his reality. His white counterparts don't have that. Like, don't have that. 
they have a different kind, they have a luxury that they don't have to perform at that level. So for the partners, it's important to listen so that you can learn and learn so that you can really understand what's going on. And once you do that, you have an obligation to your life companion to act, to get involved, to think about what you can do that demonstrates that you're all in. You're not partially in, you're not on the sideline, that you're my ride or die, we're in it together. It's me and you against the world, that kind of thing. And we're, we're gonna work this through. That's what's required. So I'm not sure if I answered that, I answered that Amelia. I, I, may, I may have gone off to a different tangent, but um, I think sufficient has been said about that. Right. <laughs> Go ahead, Amala. Sorry, Natasha. I was actually going to say, I think that um, really, really beautifully leads us to this last question around how we can show up as allies for our Black partners. Right. And if I can just add something here. I think, so I wrote a piece and it went out on Twitter and Facebook and all that stuff. And thankfully, I haven't been vilified for it. But I asked a question. Who says you're an ally? And who gets to say that you're an ally? And I juxtapose that with white people. All of a sudden, we've got everyone running to this idea that, oh, I'm now an ally. Whether it be Nike, Reebok, you know, Holt, Renfrew, and all of them, we're now an ally. Well, who says? And I asked the second question, what are you going to give up? What privilege are you going to give up? Because you've gained a privilege at my expense. As a matter of fact, 400 years. And so what are you prepared to give up? And I think some of the couples here have done that in their own relationship. That's different from being in an organization, but what they've said is that, yeah, they've had the tough conversations with family. And by doing that, yeah, there's a consequence. There's a cost. Or as Candace has said, she's just gone with Julius to the family function and just made sure that she was present. And I'm sure that she was prepared like a pit bull should anyone attack her husband. Sometimes that's it. Natasha, you've done the same. You've had that difficult conversation. It's far better. That's been an ally. You're risking something because you've identified that you have a privilege. So you're risking something that is a, is a loss to your partner. And that is the respect. That is the acceptance. And so I'll, I'll leave with this, but unless allies are prepared to really consider their privilege and what they're prepared to lose, then in my definition, you're not an ally. It's a convenient truth. It's a convenient state that says I can be an ally. And yet, when it's appropriate, I can be anonymous. So I want to I want to go back to the couples uh, just for uh, one more question here because we had a couple of questions come in from our listeners. That was very well said, though, Dr. Regisard. Like I, I'm literally just that's it's sinking into me and, and soaking into me um, right now because anybody who is in a relationship, what you're saying is, um, who is in a relationship with a black partner has to give up something in order to be an ally, and that's going to look different whether you're white or not white, but not black. Right, a person yeah. of color or indigenous. Okay, and, and before, this is before we get on to that, Natasha. I do remember what I was going to say. I had a brain freeze a second ago. With with black and white couples, I had a client about maybe two three years ago, black male, white female, and he said that what caused him to finally end a relationship and not have interracial relationships anymore is his white partner said to him one day, "If you behave this way, just remember who you are." You're a black male with your white male, your black male with a white female. Think about what happens if I call the police. If there wasn't a height of privilege that was exercised, it was that. And his, his efforts to decouple from that relationship was horrendous, absolutely horrendous. But that's an example of the extreme. I mean, we have interracial couples here that, that's different than white, black, that polarization of black and white. And that's what was said to him. And so my guess is that it will be a lot, a lot different in these relationships. And certainly the context would be a bit different, but that's what can happen. So I, I, just, leave, I just created that, said that to create a picture 
for people to kind of visualize and imagine, you know, in a relationship, someone would actually say that with the hopes that you're going to stay in a relationship, of course. <laughs> right, right. Uh, I, I have one last question. Yes, this one came in here. This is directed to the couple. So I'd like to hear from all of the couples and also get your closing thoughts at the same time, uh, guys. Um, this question is to the couples. What was it like dealing with cultural differences from a race perspective, especially as a black man? How did you work through knowing that there was anti-blackness embedded in the community of the person that you love? So I know a lot of you have talked about your relationships and how, um, you know, a lot from the direct families, the moms and the dads were very welcoming, but in the community as a whole, right? You're going to parties, you're going to barbecues, you're going to extended family, you're going to, um, you know, um, areas or events where, where that, your partner's community is, even if it wasn't directed to you and you knew that that anti-blackness and that anti-black sentiment is there, how did you feel about it? How did you deal with it? How did you communicate about it? I'll, I'll, try to, I'll try to take a go at this first. I think the first thing that you have to do sometimes is you have to acknowledge who you are. Are you a person that's always felt that you wanted to fit in or are you a person that's always felt like you kind of stood out but knew how to fit in with others? Because that, that's two types of personalities. And I think if you are somebody who wants to fit in, it's gonna be extremely difficult for you because there's some sense of belonging that you're, that you're looking for and you're never gonna get that. From, from the crowd. You're, it's just not gonna happen. Um, but if you are somebody and you're used to actually standing out somewhat, but you know how to fit in, it's more or less you have a mentality where it's, it's a take it or leave it. You, you kind of have to sometimes understand, um, I guess, people's personality types in which some people, you're getting these stares. It's either because of one or two things, either they hate interracial couples and that hate stems from something. I don't know what it is, but usually hate is a precursor to a passion of something that they feel about something. Whether, they, whether it's envy because they're not able to do what they want, whether it's they feel that it's breaking their rules because that's what they were taught and that's what's embedded in their mind, but they're still wondering how dare these people have the audacity to go outside the framework of what they're supposed to fit into. But for whatever reason, they have something that they're not secure enough with themselves to see how are these people able to be willing to stand out. So I feel like at the end of the day, if you're, if you're secure in who you are, and if you're 100% comfortable with decisions that you make, you'll acknowledge the stairs, you'll continue about your way because your happiness is what's key to you as opposed to trying to please others. And Samantha, I, I'm going to ask you the same question, but also kind of work in another question at the same time. Um, leaving, the re leaving aside the relationship aspect, how do you get the Indo-Caribbean community? And I know you guys are uh, born and raised in the, in the U.S., but how do you get the Indo-Caribbean community to see the Afro-Caribbean and people of African descent, descent in a positive light instead of the negative ones they have and or they've been conditioned to think about? So maybe this goes to your extended family, right? How do you get them yeah, to kind so, of flip the well, switch? Family and like friends who um, with the same um, Indo background. Um, when I first started uh, dating my husband and I was bringing him around my family, it was like, whoa, like a, a shocker type thing. And like for me, even though my family was okay, I still knew in my mind that um, someone who's Indo Caribbean with a black person was rare. Like I did not see that ever really. Um, and I, I feel like I don't see it as much still um, to this day because it's still kind of, you know, shunned upon. Um, but I think, you know, just I, for, in a positive outlook, you know, I, I think my husband's amazing, you know, and I also, you know, he's always around bringing around very family oriented, bringing, you know, with our family and introduce them to everybody. And then also educating, um, you know, anyone who has questions or who, who's saying or comments. I'm pretty well spoken and you know, speak out about, you know, well, this is look at it from this perspective and it's not, you know, um, not everybody is the same way because they have, you know, have a mentality that, you know, all black people are this way from wherever it doesn't matter. Um, so just educating, you know, family members and friends on, on it. 
Okay, I'm going to go over to Andrea and Ricardo now. So, uh, Ricardo, how did you work through knowing that there was uh, anti-Blackness embedded in the community, even though it wasn't coming from her direct family? Um, it was something that I kind of didn't want to make it harder for her in a sense. I didn't want it to make it, um, you know, I want to give people a chance, you know, and then one thing I would say is, the way I dealt with it was if there are friends, then my friends, and if their families might have a, a certain view of black people, then I want to hear from them. So one thing I remember is when I met some of her friends, like Ghanaian friends, one of our friends' father really took a liking to me. Like, oh, come here, boy, come here, have, have a drink, sit down, talk. <laughs> he had a party and we'd be talking for like 30, 40 minutes, an hour just talking every time he would see me, he would call my boy, come here, come here. So I know in the beginning, she might have been apprehensive, you know, um, bringing me over to this old school, you know, traditional guy in his home, but I felt comfortable. Next thing you know, I'm dancing chutney. I had no idea what chutney was. I ended up liking it. Like, why did I wait so long to know this? This is great. And you know, we're sitting with so good music and then going to carnival, all these things that I've never experienced growing up. I experienced literally when I met met her, and now I'm I'm in the car. I'm I'm playing soca. I'm playing chutney. She thinks I'm an old chutney. So, you know, it's fun. <laughs> so that's what more chutney than I do. So that's what I would say too. When we yeah. say allies, well, I think we also have to be messengers that we are also open to other traditional cultures as well. We want to know more about your background, your history, and you'll see a lot of it is similar. I, you know, we dance compa together. I, when at our wedding, I, the DJ played both, you know, cultural songs, and her side of the family was dancing to the Haitian songs, and my side was dancing to, you know, the soca and chutney. It, it was great, and I think that's the best way to gain allies and to show, hey, don't be scared in learning new things, and I think that's the way, you know, it came up about. Yeah, definitely. Like how he mentioned my friend's dad, I think a lot of it was families came in, came to the States and only knew what they knew back home. And until they were exposed and like friends didn't bring people outside of their culture home. So when, for example, I brought Ricardo to my friend's homes, their parents were more were exposed and like open and learn like, oh, okay. Like, He's another person. He's another human being that likes, you know, our music too and likes to take a drink with us. So um, there wasn't any bias or ill feeling towards him. So that's been a, a big thing. I know um, I'm, I'm like very big, like my friends have always, they've always mentioned to me too how, oh my God, my parents love Ricardo. And it's, it's like almost shocking for them. They're all, they're always surprised, but it's also, I think, goes to show that people can change you know, you think your parents are set in your ways and, but like people are coming around, um, being more open, being, you know, open to listen, to talk. They want to hear, they, they, they're learning more and more each day. And I feel how I've dealt with like outside friends or families, like I've always been quick to like, even before I was dating Ricardo, even like at work, I was quick to stand up if I heard something I didn't agree with. And so even with like, for example, you know, young um, boy cousins, you know, who grew up in New York, in the Bronx, you know, they use the slang a lot. And, you know, a lot of guys use, you know, the N-word slang with each other, with their black friends amongst, and all the Indo-Caribbean men too, and not thinking anything in a negative manner. But I'm quick to say, hey, you know, you don't know much about the history of the word, even if you're using the slang term, but I think you should not use it. Um, so that's kind of, and then there've always been, oh, I didn't mean anything by it. I hope Ricardo didn't take it that way. And I'm like, no, he knows you. And, but it's my, you know, my, my part to tell you, like, you know, no, because no one's ever said anything otherwise. So I think a very important part is being open, speaking up and like sharing. Cause like some people say things or do things not with any ill intent at the same time, but, but need to know because they're not, haven't been exposed or no one's ever corrected anyone or, you know, been too, too soft-spoken about it. So it's important to speak up um, and, you know, speak up what, like I mentioned before, what you believe in, your conviction. And I, I find that that's been really helpful. Like I, people have always been very receptive 
to it because you know it's about delivery as well so people are been very receptive and i i found that to be really helpful and i just want to add to what you mentioned about how i um going through a new homes everything else i made sure not to even though i was told hey many people might not like you because the way you look going in there with an open mind kind of diffused whatever kind of tension that may have been there saying hi to the aunties like the way i would greet my own family and everything else that really helped at that point you still want to have a certain way about me that i can't help you that's just you and, you know you're gonna yeah. have a fun life thinking that way okay so he may be dancing to chutney but does he like slight pepper or heavy pepper on the double on the, Hi, I got better. On the doubles <laughs> the basket was hot I'm sorry. No, no, he, oh, yeah. Now no. he knows about the pepper sauce. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> okay, um, I want to go to Candace and Jules. Um, some closing thoughts and also, uh, again, just to touch on, you know, Jules especially, you know, how did you work through knowing that even though anti-Black uh, sentiment was not coming from her family, her direct family, but it was embedded in the community. How did, how did you work through that? Um, for me, it was always a fear because I know how traditional families are in the Caribbean, especially Trinidad and Tobago. Traditional Indian families, tradition, traditional African families, it always seems like there's a war. Um, always stick to your own. Um, even with the politics, it comes like there's an African party and there's an Indian party. So there was always that fear. And I think what really surprised me was a family. Um, I came there initially with the fair, and somehow, I mean, <laughs> somehow or the other, it was quite contrary. Um, so I think, I'm, I, I think that was a blessing um, in that regard, but I did, I did have that initial fear in terms of meeting a family, and I think as, if it went deeper, so if it went from her mother and her father, to maybe her grandmother and her grandfather, I was like, oh my gosh, this is going even deeper into the traditional family, and this is going to be a problem, you know? That's how it is. So there's this, uh, there's this tension with, uh, especially as I said, with the political parties, that there's a race thing, um, but I got over it. Um, in fact, I think that uh, I am more Indian and she is more African. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a real unity here in terms of, you know, um, I don't know if you ever heard of the term dogla, um, but it's a, it's a word that is used in Trinidad, and it basically uh, describes us, you know, it's the fusion of African and Indian, and uh, we promote that as in uh, something of a symbol of strength, a symbol of real unity. In fact, I have a number of friends who are also married, and we have a dogla club. And we promote this to the highest, you know, because I think Trinidad and Tobago needs to look at this fusion as a sign of the future, you know, especially in terms of us. And we are, we are always out there. I mean, b both of us are involved in events. Um, so we, well, we are well aware of the chutney and the soca. Um, in, in fact, I think I know more chutney and she knows more soca. <laughs> but we are, we are out there. And we promote that, you know? We promote real unity. Yeah. Um, Jahaji Bai, you know, yeah. brotherhood on the boat. So for us, um, uh, I think our, our union um, is very symbolic, and we try to promote that, especially to the next generation, that, you know, there's no, there's no tension between the races, really and truly, there's only about unity. So yeah, that's my, um, my closing words. <laughs> Uh, for me, it's just about really embracing each other's culture, and I think we, we're still on that journey, you know, like, I think um, sometimes I would try to eat with my hand, you know, as Indians, sometimes you eat with your hand, and, you know, in the beginning, Jules was just like, oh, my God, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> you know, he, he, could, he, he, could not, he couldn't wrap his head around that, you know, but um, there's certain things that we just try to tend to embrace from each other's culture, um, and just to, like, to just touch on, you know, the, the word Dogla and the whole Doglarization of the nation. Um, the word Dogla actually came from India and it actually connotates um, an illegitimate child, 
right? So it has a negative connotation already. Um, and of course, Jules mentioned the political aspect as well. So I think for us in Trinidad, the separation and the division is made even, it's exacerbated by the political, um, political force and the colonial mm -hmm. force. And for us, I think it's really about embracing each other's culture um, and showing that, showcasing that, you know, from our, from our standpoint um, and from whatever influence and sphere that we have, is to show a positive approach to the dogorization of the nation, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and to the world, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to join that club. Well, what was that club that you had? Douglarize the nation. <laughs> oh, that's the name of the club. Okay, I want to join yeah, yeah, yeah. because my children are Dougla too. Dougla are us. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, I'm going to go to Amala for closing thoughts. Please, Amala, this has been an amazing two or hour and 45 minutes here. We've learned so much. I know I can't believe we're almost done. I feel like we're just barely scratching the surface with our um, the different couples that are uh, speaking here. Um, I think I think I want to kind of bring up something that we had talked about in our first panel when we um, spoke about talking to our elders um, and challenging anti-black racism. And the couples have all already mentioned this. Um, I just want to emphasize that as non-black people of color, I think it's very, very important for us to take responsibility for our own education and, and not make that our partner's responsibility or burden. I think there are things that we definitely learn together and that we work through together. But I think there is, um, and, and clearly there's a lot of kind of joy in that, right? Like uh, uh, Jules was saying, you know, being able to teach Candace about those things or, or, you know, watch those things together. But I think at times, especially when there is a difficulty processing grief and trauma, um, that, that we not, that we take responsibility for ourselves, right? Um, and like, like Dr. Regis Ford said, allyship is about how much are you willing to give up? And this is, again, this is something I said in our first panel. At the very least, we have to be willing to give up some comfort. Mm -hmm. um, that is really, really the least that we can do. And I think that when we see a lot of the questions coming in are, are about um, how can I talk to my family about this? How can I bring home this person when I know that my family won't approve? I understand that, you know, like I said, I, I, I'm with an African American male and I do, I do really, really understand that. But again, it's kind of being, being ready to be that person that will, that will not tolerate any sort of foolishness <laughs> um, and, and being able to to say those things and it and I'm not minimizing that in any way um, it is very very difficult um, especially when you fear the licks <laughs> uh, but uh, it is really it is the least that we can do and especially if we are committed to a black person it's our responsibility to do that, that our black partners should not have to face violence from our families or the people in our lives, we're exposing them to. So I think it's our responsibility. Obviously we can't control anybody's behavior, but um, to be able to speak in those moments. Dr. Regis heard some closing advice for us on, on just kind of everyday things that we can do to support our partner. I know we've talked about a lot about this, you know, in little uh, pieces sprinkled throughout this conversation, but we'd love for, for you to give us some, some closing tools to take away here today. I think I want to start with what Amelia said, and that is first being comfortable with discomfort. We tend to, when we are uncomfortable, want to run away from it. Let's flip the script. Let's learn to be comfortable with discomfort. I think I'd go back to, again, these couples and the couples who are listening and participating tonight. I think it's really important to acknowledge anti-black racism as the worst and most virulent form of racism there is. Understand that it is a discussion of politics in proximation to whiteness. And once we understand that, we begin to see and understand the full construct of what racism and anti-Black racism is. I think being prepared to listen so that you can learn. And when you've learned something and understand it, to be able to act and act together. 
I think if you can do that and find times to just spend and invest in each other at a deep emotional level, moving from the head to the heart, from the experiences to the emotions, that helps. Because you have a right to experience feelings and emotions. Talk at that level, because that's where you really begin to understand each other. You can really be empathetic and place yourself in the other person's shoes. And then it's a question, okay, what are we gonna do? Because you're my right or die here. I've signed on to you and you've signed on to me. It's me and you against the world. So we're gonna armor up and we're gonna go out and we're gonna fight this and fight this to win. And I think having that attitude, removing the cynicism, having that attitude will help and strengthen your relationship because now it's something outside of you because you've dealt what's inside of both of your lives. It's now something in your outside world that you can contend with. I love this. Um, I'm, I will be booking a session with you. So <laughs> <laughs> just letting you know that. Uh, listen, all of our couples, we've had nothing but positive comments coming in uh, on our chat here. You guys have been, we, we appreciate you opening yes. up yes. with us. I mean, it's very personal, right? Everybody's story is very personal. And so we just want to say thank you for that. And thank you for your insight, Dr. Regisford. Uh, Amala Baksh, our mental health specialist. She, Honestly, between the two of you, I think you've, you've sort of given us, I know I've learned some stuff here today. And these are conversations that we want to keep having and conversations that we don't get to have a lot of whenever we hear about, um, you know, couples, especially it's usually uh, white and black. And as Amala said, written from the perspective of, of the white author. <laughs> So this is, this is really nice to hear. Next week is uh, part three of our session, the final uh, part where we're talking to our Dogla children. No, I'm just kidding. We are talking to our mixed children. We are going to talk about the history of the word Dogla, though, because it does have those negative connotations to it. How is it for our Afro-Indo kids, right? They're seeing this on TV, and, you know, one looks like mommy, one looks like daddy. One, you know, one of them looks like mommy or daddy, but not both. So, you know, they have to exist within these two different very... Uh, very different racial spaces. So this is what we're going to be talking about next week, next Thursday, 7.30 p.m. And of course, we'll be releasing the panelists for that on social media this weekend. So once again, uh, everyone's saying looking forward to the next session. Thank you, Nadia D. That's um, amazing. But thank you again. Uh, we're on social media. It's uh, on Instagram. Uh, the BG Diaries, plural, is uh, the handle. So yeah, there it is. Ashley just posted it to the chat. So once again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And until next week. Thanks for right. having us. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And it's always heavy pepper, never mind. Thanks for me. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay.